Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing histamine receptors. Okay, so we're currently in the process of discussing heterotrimeric G proteins so that we can understand uh, the nomenclature that I'm going to use uh, to show you which heterotrimeric G proteins each one of these histamine receptors interacts with. Okay, so we've talked about the 16 different genes for alpha subunits. We're not going to talk about all the different uh, splice variants. Okay, because pretty much the different splice variants do the same thing as um, each other. So if you have one gene that's got multiple splice variants, its splice variants pretty much all do the same thing, at least as far as we can tell. Right. So, um, we'll now talk about the beta subunits. Okay, so beta next. Uh, so basically for beta, there are five genes Okay, and then there are six subunits, so by now we can understand how this can be, basically. Uh, it's again going to be because one of these genes has two splice variants. Okay, so basically the five genes for beta are named very nice and sensibly. You have beta 1, beta 2, beta 3, beta 4, and beta 5. So these are the five genes which code for five different uh, beta subunits, but this beta 5 gene has actually got five different spli oh, sorry, two different splice variants. Okay, so it has one splice variant that is called beta 5 5, and then it has beta 5 L as its other splice variant. So these are the two splice variants of this gene. Okay, so overall you can produce six different beta subunits. You can produce the beta 1 subunit, the beta 2 subunit, the beta 3 subunit, the beta 4 subunit, the beta 5 5 subunit, and the beta 5 L subunit. Okay, so those are our six different beta subunits. Now let's go to the gamma subunits. Okay, so for the gamma subunit, there are 12 different genes for gamma subunits, and there are 12 different subunits, so this is nice and simple. Okay, and it has quite a nice simple naming system as well, with one little blip in its naming. Okay, so basically you have the gamma 1 gene and the gamma 1 subunit, the gamma 2 gene which codes for the gamma 2 subunit, the gamma 3 gene which codes for the gamma 3 subunit, and so on, gamma 4, gamma 5, but then there's no gamma 6, and this is the little blip in the naming system. You go up to gamma 7 and then it continues on all the way to gamma 13 with no more blips, okay? So gamma 11, gamma 12 and then gamma 13. So it's not gamma 1 to gamma 12, instead it's gamma 1 to gamma 5, gamma 7 to gamma 13. Okay, and that overall gives us 12 different gamma genes, which each code for a single protein, which is that uh, gamma subunit. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Okay, right. So, Overall, that gives us an absolutely massive scope for making a huge number of different heterotrimeric G proteins. Now, usually, uh, people do not tell you the exact heterotrimeric G protein that you are working with. Okay, so for instance, what you might think would be a very nice way of naming heterotrimeric G proteins is you would say, Okay, we have a heterotrimeric G protein, and you label exactly which alpha subunit you have. So let's say we had G alpha I1, okay, which we remember was an alpha subunit that was in the alpha I slash naught family of alpha subunits. Then let's say we have beta 1 and then gamma 1, okay, and that would specify uh, an exact heterotrimeric G protein. Okay, people don't usually do that because usually they don't know um, which um, het exact heterotrimeric G protein they're dealing with. Instead, people will usually say, okay, this is a heterotrimeric G protein and we'll call it GI slash naught. Okay, so heterotrimeric G proteins are usually just named according to which alpha subunit they have. Okay, so uh, if they were being rigorous, they'd tell you that they, it was a GI1 heterotrimeric G protein because that would tell you that the alpha subunit was alpha I1. But often people don't even tell you which alpha subunit specifically it is. Instead, they tell you which of the four families it is in. So usually, heterotrimeric G proteins are not labeled according to which 
three subunits they have. Instead, they're just labeled according to which alpha subunit they have. And usually, you don't specify specifically which alpha subunit. You just say which of the four families it's in, i.e., is it in the GS family? Is it in the GI0 family? Is it in the GQ11 family? Or is it in the G1213 family? Okay, so that's the way that we're going to name these heterotrimeric G proteins. Okay, and the reason for it is generally we don't know which specific heterotrimeric G proteins uh, we're dealing with. And often the reason that these alpha subunits are all put into these families like this is because alpha subunits that are in the same family generally do the same thing, or at least an almost identical thing. So all of these, well, both of these here and all of the splice variants of alpha S, for instance, will activate adenyl alcyclase. These ones will all uh, inhibit adenyl alcyclase. Uh, these ones will uh, act on phospholipase C beta, etc. Okay, so let's then say which of the heterotrimeric G proteins each of these is going to interact with. So H1 interacts with a heterotrimeric G protein Q11, okay? So what does that mean? It means that the alpha subunit of the heterotrimeric G protein that the H1 receptor will interact with will be in this Q-11 family down here. Okay, uh, the H2 histamine receptor generally interacts with a heterotrimeric G protein in the uh, GS, okay, of the GS kind, which means that the alpha subunit of this heterotrimeric G protein, which H2 will interact with, is generally in this alpha S family here. H3 and H4 both interact with G proteins of the I slash naught type, which again means that the alpha subunit of uh, the heterotrimeric G proteins that H3 and H4 interact with uh, will be in this G alpha I naught family of um, alpha subunits of heterotrimeric G proteins. Okay, right. Uh, so that's the. Um, uh, which heterotrimeric G proteins each of these four receptors interact with. Now I want to talk about some drugs which uh, interact with each of these receptors. So we'll start off with the main one, okay? So we'll start off with H1, okay? And the entire family of drugs that are called antihistamines, uh, these work on the H1 receptor rather than all the others. Well, they're, they're not actually that selective for H1, but they are pr quite selective for H1 at least. Okay, they have a pr preference to H1. Okay, so let's now discuss the antihistamines. Okay, and antihistamines is the sort of colloquial uh, word for meaning H1 antagonists. Okay, so these are drugs which will bind to the H1 receptor, okay, uh, where the histamine would like to bind, and they will not activate the receptor, but they will stop the histamine from being able to bind to the receptor itself. Okay, so what they do is they block the activation of the receptor via uh, the histamine, basically. Okay, so uh, antihistamine drugs are generally split into three categories. Okay, so you start off with what are known as the first generation antihistamine drugs. Okay, and this includes drugs such as mepiramine, which um, is also called perilamine. Okay, so mepiramine is a competitive antagonist for H1 receptors, and it's a first generation antihistamine, and its other name is perilamine. Okay, so perilamine. Right, okay. Uh, so, um, the, ca the characteristic of all first generation antihistamines is that they are capable of crossing the blood brain barrier. Okay, so it can cross the blood brain barrier, and this means. Um, that they can go into the brain and they can cause havoc, basically. They can interact with histamine receptors in the brain, and the main form of histamine receptor that you have in the brain is H3 receptors. And these drugs aren't terribly selective for H1 over H3, so they often block H3, and that can cause uh, sedation, basically. So they cause sedation. Now, some of these drugs are actually used for sed as sedatives now to calm people down.
Okay, but the problem with them when they were used uh, for our anti-inflammatory purposes is that they had the side effect of making you tired. Okay, so some other examples of first uh, generation antihistamines are chlorphenamine and promethazine. Okay, so chlorphenazine, sorry, chlorphenamine, okay, and also promethazine. Promethazine. Okay, so mepiramine, which is also called pyrimidine, uh, chlorphenamine, and promethazine are all first generation antihistamines. And chlorphenamine and promethazine are now, I think, used as uh, sedatives, basically. Okay, so let's move on to the second generation antihistamines. Okay, and second generation antihistamines are also called non sedating antihistamines. So these are the non sedating antihistamines, and they're called that because uh, they do not cross the blood brain barrier. Okay, that's the difference between them and the first generation ones. They cannot cross the blood brain barrier, and therefore they do not. Uh, cause the sedation because if they can't cross the blood brain barrier, they can't interact with neurons, so they don't have any effect on the brain, at least not in principle. Okay, so they don't cross the blood brain barrier. Now, examples of second generation antihistamines would be tofenadine, okay, and also cetirizine. So, tofenadine and cetirizine. Okay, and cetirizine is commonly used for hay fever as an anti-inflammatory. Okay, tofenadine is no longer used, and the reason tofenadine is no longer used is that it has a problem. It basically causes cardiac toxicity, okay, so it can prop propagate uh, dysrhythmias, which is obviously a big problem. Okay, so now we also have third generation antihistamines. Uh, which are based on the second generation antihistamines, uh, but are cardio safe antihistamines. So the third generation antihistamines are also called uh, the cardio safe antihistamines. Okay, and the sort of archetypal example of a third generation antihistamine would be the drug uh, thexophenadine. Okay, so all of these drugs are competitive antagonists for the H1 receptor. So they specifically block the H1 receptor. And generally, the first generation ones uh, were less good at selectivity, okay? So they would interact with some of the other receptors, particularly the H3 receptor when they cross the blood-brain barrier. Uh, but these ones further down, such as thaxophenidine, for instance, is extremely H1 selective. Okay, right. Uh, so, Let's now talk about drugs which interact with the other two types of um, histamine receptor. Well, sorry, the other four types. Sorry, other three types. Uh, but we're not going to talk about H4 because its pharmacology isn't well understood at all. So we're now going to talk about H2 and H3. So I'll get a bit more paper here. Okay, so uh, let's talk about H2 then first. So basically, you have an agonist for H2 receptors. So an example of an agonist uh, for H2 receptors is a drug known as dimaprit. Okay, so dimaprit is a drug which is an agonist for H2 receptors. So it will bind to H2 receptors and stimulate it just like histamine. And the difference between dimaprit and histamine is that it's a selective agonist for H2 receptors. So dimaprit will not activate the H1 and the H3 receptors the way that histamine also will. Uh, and of course, histamine will also activate the H4 receptors. Okay, um, whereas dimaprit is selective. Now, uh, there are also competitive antagonists uh, for H2 receptors, which will bind to the H2 receptor and block histamine from being able to bind there, and hence prevent the activation. Now, uh, these drugs are used um, to prevent gastric acid secretion, okay? And the two main examples are cimetidine, Okay, and also uh, ranitidine. Okay, so cimetidine and ranitidine are both competitive H2 receptor antagonists, and they're selective for the H2 receptor over H1 and H3.
OK, finally, let's talk about H3, uh, which has a bit of a pharmacology. Not much compared to H1 and H2, uh, but more certainly than H4. OK, so a selective agonist for H3 receptors would be thioperamide. OK, so this is a selective agonist, a drug which will bind to selectively the H3 receptor and activate it. OK, just like histamine would, but selective this time for the H3 receptor. OK, and then a selective competitive antagonist for H3 receptor, uh, receptors is the drug methylhistamine. OK, or specifically alpha methylhistamine. OK, and this is the one drug where I'm going to actually show you the structure in this video uh, because this one is very easy to understand. Basically, if we go back to our structure of histamine, OK, here is our structure of histamine. Well, the alpha carbon was this carbon, always this carbon. OK, so basically alpha methylhistidine is when you take off this hydrogen here and stick a methyl group on there. OK, so you have a methyl group coming off the alpha carbon, so let's just draw that out. OK, so here's the amino group of histamine. OK, here's the alpha carbon with one hydrogen coming off now, and now this new methyl group, OK? And then you have the R group of histamine, which basically has this methylene group. And then coming off the methylene group, you then have the imidazole ring, this five-membered ring containing these two nitrogen atoms, like so, and these two double bonds. OK. And then we'll just saturate all the remaining bonds with hydrogens coming off. OK, so this is alpha methylhistamine here. OK, and the structure is quite helpful for understanding how this drug will bind to the receptor, similar to the way histamine would, but then uh, this methyl group is then preventing it from actually activating the receptor, and instead it just sits there and blocks histamine from being able to bind there. OK, so that now concludes our discussion of the histamine receptors.